welcome everybody. I'm glad you were able to come and uh, we look forward to an interesting morning and afternoon. Some of the research that we've been doing over the past, geez, six, seven years now has been primarily with Japanese barberry control. I'm sure if you're here, you're probably all well familiar with it, and it is quite a nuisance, um, as with most invasive species. And we're going to talk today a little bit about control, which is can be difficult with invasive plants. Um, this is a great example. I know, looking out here, I know this is not part of the state park, but it's an excellent example of what happens um, and why barberry gets established. Often it gets established on old agricultural land where animals were grazing, livestock was grazing. This is a relatively recent infestation. We're out there, we noticed that when we're doing it, we're getting a lot of deer ticks on it, black-legged ticks. These are the... Um, the ones that carry the spirochete that gives people and domestic animals Lyme disease. But I ran with the research, so I've been doing follow-up research since on this relationship between the barberry infestations and tick abundance. Um, and there's been, it, it's pretty dramatic, the positive correlation between that habitat and that habitat in terms of tick abundances. Um, so we've been trapping mice, doing tick sampling, in areas such as this, in areas such as this where barberry doesn't exist, and then in areas where we controlled it. And we're finding that our numbers are constantly changing as we're gathering data, but it's approximately 140 infected ticks per acre in there, about 10 infected ticks per acre over there. So that's a 14-fold difference, which is fairly dramatic. And as we control it, um, you know, we start seeing a decline in tick abundance, um, more mimicking that than what formerly was that. Um, largely that's because, as you can see, it creates a canopy. It's really, I mean, it's pretty dense in there. And what that does is it retains the humidity. At night, typically humidity levels rise to about 100% humidity, and then during the day, those tend to fall down. And in those, it, the humidity remains, and the ticks require that humidity to survive. So a tick over there has about eight hours throughout the day where it needs to retreat because conditions are below 80% relative humidity. So it has to retreat under the leaf litter to stay hydrated. And then here, only one hour out of the day does relative humidity get below 80%. So for 23 hours of the day, they can seek a host in here waiting for another blood meal to advance to the next stage to lay eggs and so forth. So it's just the microclimate difference in there that lends itself to increased tick abundances. But for some reason also we're finding that um, the majority of ticks, a higher percentage of ticks are infected with the spirochete in these infestations. That's the other thing is the deer play a major role in shaping our forest to look like that because they're eating everything else. The barberry is very browse resistant, deer don't like to eat it. They eat everything else, which gives that a leg up, gives it a competitive advantage. Um, so we found, it is a stubborn plant, as you know, and the best way to do it, we found, is through a two-stage process. Um, a lot of people just think cutting it down once will take care of it, but it doesn't. Actually, it makes it even stronger, so it comes back. Some of our plots, we cut it down. Um, we, that killed about 5% of the plants on site, and if you went back there now, it's even more vigorous than it was previously. So what we suggest to folks, we have a whole an array of, of tools here, and um, what we suggest is mechanically removing the above ground. And, um, and we've done timing trials and done, um, in the spring, midsummer, late fall. It doesn't matter when you do it. But um, when you cut it down, it uses its root reserves to put up new shoots. These new, new growth comes out, out of that rootstock. And about a month or two later, 
you know, when you have, you cut down a large plant, then you're dealing with a much smaller one, and you're using less chemical if you're using, going that way, and um, you really only have to manage a much smaller plant. It is the non-chemical alternative, but um, if you're going to go this route, we'd suggest doing mechanical treatment followed up by propane.